Death Grip by Matt Samet. Epilogue. Allison Kelliger lost her life in May 2010 after a cycling accident in North Boulder. She was on her bicycle until the very end. I'd moved back to town in 2007 to take a job as editor of Climbing, transferring with the title as it changed owners and pulled up roots in Carbondale. By chance, I rented an apartment in Gun Barrel, only a quarter mile from where Allison and her husband, Bill, another champion cyclist, lived. I'd see them on the two-lane roads in the eastern county, cycling in file or together on a tandem. Alice and I met up often during those years, taking Clyde on walks around the Twin Lakes near our homes, or chatting via phone or email. Although Allison had a full-fledged benzo counseling practice by then, she never once mentioned charging me to talk about withdrawal. We'd become friends, and our conversations were things shared between friends. Allison's giving spirit and infinite wisdom carried me through those years, and I count myself fortunate to have been one of the hundreds of people she helped to heal from benzos. Unfortunately, the psychiatric establishment tried to prevent Allison from sharing her expertise. In 2008, a Denver-area addiction psychiatrist, having found one of Allison's advertisement for benzo counseling, turned her in to the Colorado State Board of Medical Examiners for practicing medicine without a license. An investigator then posed as a new benzo patient to whom Allison recommended the Ashton Manual as a starting point, and the matter was referred to a district attorney. At no time did Allison, with a master's in psychotherapy, ever recommend to me or to anyone else what to do with our medicines or dosages. I remember her frustration at being unable to find a physician to work with, a benzo-wise GP or psychiatrist to whom she could refer patients for the prescription side of things. Allison's practice focused solely on supportive talk therapy and other means of coping with the withdrawal syndrome. Nonetheless, she faced a potential year in prison and an expensive, emotionally draining legal battle which she did ultimately win. The biggest tragedy, however, was that the experience made Allison pull back from her practice. At one point, she'd spoken to me about co-authoring a book of survivor stories and advanced the notion, which she'd discussed with other Yahoo moderators of a dedicated benzo withdrawal facility. On one of my final talks with her, aggrieved by the psychiatric establishment and its litigious watchdogs, all Allison could say was, I don't want to have anything to do with benzos ever again she told me, had already taken enough of her life. Allison knew I'd been working on a magazine piece about my experience, but she passed away just one month before it appeared in the June 2010 issue of Outside. Before the piece went to press, my editor there, Alex, wondered if I might call my old psychiatrist to solicit my medical records for fact-checking. I did so only with reluctance, not especially wanting to deal with Dr. Porridge again. The doctor and I played voicemail tag until he left this message. I met. It's Dr. Porridge. I understand that you would like a copy of your chart, um, which we can make ab available for you. There would be just kind of a nominal charge for copying, and then I would ask that if you come across anything that's of concern to you, that you schedule some time with me to review whatever you might see that concerns you. There's nothing I'm particularly worried will be concerning. There's nothing in the chart that is, I think, you know, that you and I haven't discussed along the way. But I would ask that you do that. And also, I understand that you're planning on doing some writing, I assume for a publication. I don't know if you're planning on writing about your care with me directly, but if you're writing something that uses my name or, you know, anything attributed to me, then I would ask for the opportunity to review it before it's published. Take care. Bye-bye. How I hated that message. The idea of scheduling time with Dr. Porridge, of setting foot in his office, and even if only for 15 minutes, taking on the mantle of patient again, not to mention giving him the opportunity to review my writing, sent cold sewage through my veins. This man had no claim over me, but he still acted as if he did. Now I understood how Allison felt. These pills have already taken enough of my life. It's scary being just one person against something as ironclad as the pharmacomedical hegemony. Truth be told, even after St. Martin's Press accepted the proposal for this book, I thought of pulling the plug for that very reason. This is the context in which we find ourselves. Psychiatrists and Big Pharma have no interest in anyone going off their pills. Yet at the same time, anyone outside the system who dares to offer guidance or an alternative point of view is subject to harassment and prosecution, creating a culture of fear, suspicion, and paranoia. I don't offer advice or even website links to people who cold call or email me, having read my story and outside and professing that they want to get off benzos. I'm not willing to take that risk, to be lured that way, to fall victim to some mole for the doctors. The real question is, how did things get so messed up? Well, if you can answer that one in 5,000 pages or less. 
Let's restart with the real question. <clears throat> the real question is, how did these things get so messed up? Well, if you can answer that one in 5,000 pages or less, you can probably unpack other issues of pressing global import, like the financial collapse of the first world, America's endless deficit incurring warmongering, the failed war on drugs, and America's booming prison economy, the corporatization of politics, man's wanton exploitation of Earth's natural resources, and so on. Basically, you would need to pen a treatise explaining cowardice, evil, power lust, arrogance, and greed, and then in metaphysical terms reveal how and where humanity went wrong. Maybe it wasn't at, at an apple tree somewhere in the Garden of Eden, or maybe it was in a chemist's lab at some pharmaceutical company, or maybe it was both. Despite what you've read, I don't believe that psychiatry is categorically evil. Maybe only 98%. And I'm no mental illness denier. There are dark anomalies in perception and mood that we might, if we must, label illness. I've seen antipsychotics help a good friend and one family member, by marriage, come back from psychosis and resume meaningful lives. For them, it's a delicate balancing act between side effects like weight gain and sluggishness and the torment of their condition. I've met people on lithium who, while they detest the drug's mood-flattening effects, also loud the stability it's important. And I've had... Climber friends come up to me knowing my story and ask what I think about the ADHD and antidepressant drugs they're considering for their children. I try not to be dogmatic. I tell them that my story has so many twists and turns that it's not like, likely this will happen to their kids. And I remind them that my central problem was dependence on benzodiazepines, by far the worst drug I've withdrawn from. And I do concede that for years the low dose of Paxil I was on helped me at least as the placebo, through depression, until like a beloved dog gone rabid it turned, baring its fangs. I would never judge anyone for taking psych meds, just as I hope they wouldn't judge me for choosing not to. It's hard enough, to, it's hard enough facing the darkness without a chorus shouting criticism in your ear. But what I do tell my climber friends is this. Don't rely solely on the meds, but also, or only, engage with a good therapist. Educate. Educate yourself about the complications and side effects and withdrawal syndromes of every last pill because they all have their cons and they all have washout periods persisting potentially much longer than per the official literature. They all, precisely because they act on neurotransmitter systems, exact changes in the brain that are slow to reverse. And I say, keep your eye on the dosage and number of pills your child is taking because it's not something to let snowball. And finally, a piece of advice I would give anyone, adult or child alike, if you're considering a psychiatric medicine, make sure you and your prescribing physician develop an exit plan that you both sanction, because someday you might want to go off the medication, at which point you may find your doctor is your worst enemy. You might get pregnant and not want to court the possible birth defects that come with taking SSRIs, or you might realize that any pain you feel as a course of nature is preferable to that caused by psychiatry. You might realize, like me, that the depression and anxiety you feel on the drugs are orders of magnitude worse than they would be au naturel. You might realize, as the journalist Robert Whitaker postulates in his book Anatomy of an Epidemic, that the drugs are creating chronicity, relapsing, downward spiraling mental illness in fact caused by drug-induced changes in neural receptors and concurrent rebound in your original symptoms every time you try to quit that has your doctor, and hence you, convinced that you must never, ever stop. Or you might develop philosophical objections, concluding that, as with so many pillars of our quick-fix McCountry, psychiatry has metastasized into an untrustworthy, all-devouring leviathan, and you don't want its tentacles wrapped around your skull another millisecond. One thing I don't tell my friends, not wanting to sound like a crank, is that based on my interactions, I found psychiatrists on the whole to be arrogant, power-mad bloviators who will dig in like a muddy dog being dragged to the bathtub if you so much as question the efficacy of their tools. I don't tell them that the profession, in staking chemical claim to an organ as infinitely complex as the human brain, seems to attract mountbanks, charlatans, and voodoo witch doctors more interested in pharmaceutical tinkering than people. I don't repeat the classic quote of a fellow ward of Hopkins as we watched a gaggle of doctors breeze past officiously one evening, white coats flapping in their wake. I've come to realize they aren't gods.
and I don't bother mucking about with a discussion of chemical imbalances, which I must assume my friends have been told is the cause of their children's woes. I heard this hypothesis trotted out again and again at the hospitals, an assertion as misleading, simple-minded, and jingoistic as a first-grade teacher drilling into her students' heads that it was Columbus, and only Columbus, who discovered the Americas. Take your meds, the doctors and nurses would urge us. It's just like a diabetic needing his insulin. I even have a worksheet. Brain chemistry and mental illness from Hopkins that frames the idea in grasping idiot man-child verbiage. In mental illness, there is a chemical imbalance similar to diabetes. If you don't have certain chemicals in your brain, it doesn't work right, and you have mental illness. In diabetes, a person needs insulin to live for the rest of his or her life. In mental illness, you need certain medicines to replace the chemicals in your brain for the rest of your life. The rest of your life. As if from cradle to grave, a person is no more than the sum of his neurochemical activity. As if, as per Hopkins' incomplete metaphor, your brain, like a malfunctioning pancreas, isn't producing enough Paxil. So much of modern psychiatry's, or more aptly, psychopharmacology's, drug-mongering can be traced back to this theory of a chemical imbalance, which arose in 1965 when Dr. Joseph Schildkraut published The Catecholamine Hypothesis of Affective Disorders in the journal in the American Journal of Psychiatry. To sum up what has become known as the monoamine hypothesis, depression is supposedly caused by a deficiency of certain neurotransmitters, in particular the monoamine serotonin and neuroepinephrine, as well as dopamine. This was deduced by the fact that antidepressants, proven effective in clinical and drug trial settings, are known chemically to increase the amount of neurotransmitters available in the synapses. Thus, it was surmised, the drugs work by addressing a pre-existing deficiency of those neurotransmitters. There are two main problems with this hypothesis, however. First of all, no direct diagnostic text has ever been devised to measure brain levels of neurotransmitters, or that shows any chemical link between a specific mental illness and a specific neurotransmitter system. The best psychiatrists have mustered is such indirect observation as, writes Daniel Carlot in Unhinged, measurements of neurotransmitter breakdown products in the blood, urine, or cerebrospinal fluid, CSF. A half century after Thorazine, despite any perception of psychopharmacologists as supreme neural alchemists, you still cannot walk into a shrink's office, have your neurotransmitter levels measured like car fluids at Jiffy Lube, and then walk out with a perfect chemically tailored prescription. The second problem with the monoamine hypothesis is that antidepressants might, as demonstrated convincingly in Irving Kirsch's The Emperor's New Drugs, work mostly through the placebo effect anyway. Kirsch's meta-analysis of 42 clinical trials, including negative trials proprietary to the drug companies that were buried in the FDA archives and which Kirsch obtained through the Freedom of Information Act, of the six antidepressants most pres prescribed between 1987 and 1999 showed that placebos were 82% as efficacious as the drugs. Kirsch had reached similar findings through another meta-analysis of 38 studies he and Guy Saperstein undertook in 1998. That improvement in patients who had been given a placebo was about 75% of the response to the real medication, meaning that only 25% of the benefit of antidepressant treatment was really due to the chemical effect of the drug. A clinically meaningless difference and one that pointed to antidepressants performing little better than sugar pills. As Kirsch frames it, the placebo effect, or the difference between the placebo and no treatment, was double that of the drug effect, or the difference between response to the placebo and response to the drug. Given all the troubling side effects, then, of antidepressants, it would seem to make little sense to take them. Moreover, Kirsch has postulated that an enhanced placebo effect and the perceived effectiveness of antidepressants, namely that by causing noticeable side effects that cause patients to break blind in the classic double blind, placebo control studies used to bring the drugs to the market, antidepressants convince a patient that he's receiving an effective treatment, and hence not the placebo. The depressed subject, being in psychospiritual hell, of course wants to feel better and will, thus cued, go on to get well. Kirsch supports his case by arguing that active placebos, pills with side effects that aren't antidepressants like barbiturates, benzos, and synthetic thyroid hormone, have produced similar findings. With the monoamine hypothesis firmly in place from the mid-1960s on, psychiatrists quickly began to extrapolate the notion that all psychiatric illnesses were caused by similar neurochemical imbalances, using the known chemical action of psychoactive drugs as their proof. Therefore, if an antipsychotic like Thorazine or Haldol 
was known to suppress dopamine activity, then schizophrenic psychosis surely was caused by an excess of dopamine. And if an SSRI antidepressant like Prozac increased serotonin activity, then depression surely was caused by a deficit of serotonin. And if an anxiolytic like Valium augmented GABA activity, then anxiety surely was caused by a deficiency of GABA. And later, as happened to me, if you have a bad reaction to an SSRI, a class of drugs known to induce mania and those not formally manic, then surely you must be bipolar. This pseudoscientific approach attempts to reverse engineer the root causes of mental illness using man-made molecules as diagnostic tools. It also, conveniently for Big Pharma, evolved in lockstep with an explosion in new, ever better psychiatric chemicals over the past half century. However, the flawed, reductive lens that is the chemical imbalance theory needs to be tossed on the scrap heap. Again, even though decades of research have not come up with a single direct diagnostic test to provide any evidence, the hypothesis has been continually touted by psychiatry and accepted at face value by the mainstream. Yet, as Dr. Ashton once said of the initial enthusiasm, enthusiasm for the theory, of course these naive and simple hopes turned out to be in vain. Fifty years later, we still do not know the cause of schizophrenia or depression or even how the drugs work. And as Dr. Peter Bregan has famously written, the only biochemical imbalances that we can identify with certainty in the brains of psychiatric patients are the ones produced by psychiatric treatment itself. Another contributing factor to psychiatry's current overreach is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders a tome with 16 different groups of disorders that psychiatrists use to diagnose and hence prescribe for various conditions. Compiling all official mental illnesses and their symptoms, the DSM has metastasized to the point of pathologizing normal variances in personality, if not personality itself. The DSM was once but barely a pamphlet. The first edition, from 1952, was a small notebook, while its second iteration, in 1968, contained 134 spiral-bound pages and 182 diagnoses. Both had a quaint, archaic flavor, with an emphasis on Freudian notions like neurosis. Then came DSM-3, published in 1980, the field's attempt to apply scientific rigor to the diagnosis of mental illness. DSM-3 reached 494 pages and offered a vast menu of 265 different diagnoses. Thanks largely to its then-editor, the psychiatrist Robert Spitzer, who held raucous editorial gatherings at Columbia University during which 15 psychiatrists, handpicked by Spitzer, hollered out symptom checklists and pet names for new disorders. To qualify for a specific disorder, a patient now had to evidence a certain number of symptoms. For example, five of the nine symptoms for a major depression, a number picked more or less at random. As Spitzer told Daniel J. Carlat, the author of Unhinged, four just seemed like not enough, and six seemed like too much. The goal with these checklists was to introduce reliability into the profession, to increase the odds that a patient presenting with a certain set of symptoms to one psychiatrist would receive the same diagnosis from another. Because psychiatry has long been the red-headed stepchild of the medical world, its treatments and biological underpinnings shaky at best, this was the field's big chance for self-legitimization, writes Robert Whitaker. With the publication of DSM-3, psychiatry had publicly donned a white coat. When the DSM-4 came out in 1994, it had grown to 886 pages and boasted 32 tasty new entrees. The latest iteration, the DSM-5-TR, which came out in 2000, contains 365 different diagnoses, and there is a DSM-5 underway, due in 2013. But the book is not some pure, unsullied, holy text free of pharmaceutical industry complications. Ninety-five of DSM-5-TR's 170 contributors had financial ties to drug companies, including, wrote Marsha Engel in the New York Review of Books, all of the contributors to the sections on mood disorders and schizophrenia. In a recent study of 141 members of the work groups drafting the DSM-5 found similar numbers, with 57% having such linkages. The book is now so heavy you could so ha The book is now so heavy you could lobotomize someone with one whack to the head. The result of this disorder multiplication has been that the boundaries of mental illness are pushed farther into the realm of normalcy. It's prime new real estate the drug companies have been happy to claim. For example, GlaxoSmithKline marketing Paxil for the nebulous social anxiety disorder, a pathologization of what we once called shyness, or most nefariously, 
Childhood Bipolar Disorder, a murky catch-all that lets parents and schools medicate the unholy hell out of irritable children, sometimes to death, as in 2006 with four-year-old Rebecca Riley of Boston, who had been prescribed Depakote, Seroquel, and Clonidine. We must imagine that psychiatrists keep a brain with perfect chemical equilibrium in a vault somewhere in the psychiatry super friend's fortress of power probably next to the cryogenically frozen ideal human being, one with no quirks of character, mood fluctuations, or anomalous personality tra traits. Otherwise, none of this polydrugging, electroshocking, overdiagnosing, off-label prescribing, overprescribing shit show would make sense. Otherwise, this taking of marginally anxious, depressed people and this placing them of them on four, five, six, or seven drugs designed for hardcore mental disorders like psychosis and schizophrenia would be morally reprehensible. Otherwise, this instatement and removal of powerful psychoactive drugs with careless haste, this abandonment of patients to find their way alone through the desert back to chemical-free living would be abominable. Otherwise, promiscuous psychiatry would be one of the most frightening and objectionable trends in the world, up there with corpora corporations filling patents for the human genome. If we keep heading in this direction, you might someday be able to open your 30,000-page DSM-11 and see a yearbook photo of yourself right next to the label, Your Name Here Disorder, perhaps even with the logo of the pharmaceutical company sponsoring your personalized genetic therapy. However... The good news, at least for now, is that you can still walk away. No one is forcing you to take drugs. They're out there, they're for sale, and they have their dangers. But unless the courts, jails, hospitals, your family, or you yourself have mandated it, no one can stand there and make you swallow pills. You do have some minor say in the matter. For this, I am grateful. I'm not oblivious to the fact that I put all those pills in my mouth and swallowed them thousands of times, for use, for abuse, for whatever you might call it. I do share some responsibility, and from a psychiatrist's point of view, I'm sure my history looks somewhat inevitable, a continuum of anxiety and depression reaching back to my parents' divorce at age 10, reappearing in high school as agoraphobia, and then, thanks to poor self-care, finally becoming chronic depression and a panic disorder in my early 20s, all with intermittent bouts of all with intermittent bouts of substance abuse that eventually fostered a mood cycling disorder. To them, I am a classic addict neurotic in need of ongoing pharmaceutical intervention. But again, from where I sit, the paradigm only served to make me sicker, crazed, and fragile in a way that I have not yet felt shedding the drugs. Bad things happened in my life that might or might not have sensitized me to anxiety, but that doesn't mean they permanently define my identity. All such thinking and a search for an external chemical fix ever did was strip away my personality and extinguish every last vestige of hope. In 2011, Dr. Ashton released an update to her original manual called the Ashton Manual Supplement, an important document I'd urge anyone interested in the subject to read. In it, she laments the fact that little clinical progress has been made since 2002, when the manual first came out, that the pills are still over-prescribed globally, often in excessive doses and frequently for too long, with prescriptions on the rise in some countries and that doctors on the whole still lack the expertise to help long-term users taper. However, Ashton also extends a sprig of hope. Based on a CAT scan study of a small sample of long-time users, benzos likely don't cause lasting structural damage to the brain. No death of neurons, brain shrinkage, or atrophy, etc., but instead might only cause functional changes. That is, even if you take benzos for years, you haven't permanently fried your hardware. It's just that the software runs a little differently. This is incredibly hopeful, especially given what I've been through. It affirms the fact that I can remain the primary architect of my reality now and forever. To me, despite any lingering symptoms, this more than anything equals a full recovery. It is important to remember that by far the greatest majority of long-term benzodiazepine users do recover from withdrawal, given time, writes Ashton in the supplement. Even protracted symptoms tend to decrease gradually, sometimes over years. The brain, like the rest of the body, has an enormous capacity for adapting and self-healing. That is how life survives and how ex-benzodiazepine quote-unquote addicts can be optimistic about their future. Optimism about one's future. It's all I ever asked for during the worst years, and it's the one kindness that the doctors never extended. Hope. It used to be a four-letter word to me in my cynical, druggy years, but now it's everything. 
If my friend Andrew hadn't given me hope that day in September 2006 after my blowout at Rifle, if he'd yanked the wheel left to take us to the hospital instead of continuing straight up the highway to Carbondale, hope would have vanished for good. The doctors would have put me back on psychotropic medicines, maybe even benzos, and I wouldn't have had the strength to taper again. I would not exist. This book would not exist. And you'd not be reading this last word here. <laughs>